you, know, you with us at the Center for Public Leadership. And what I'd like to do is walk through a series of questions that we ask as part of our Lessons of Leadership archive project. Um, the first set of questions have to do um, quite a bit about your experience as an individual. So to start, I, I'd be curious to know what happened or did not happen in your early life that might help explain um, your call to action and, and your call to leadership. <laughs> we, we we're getting very Freudian here. <laughs> um, I guess you just look back and say, okay, maybe these things had something to do with how you turned out. I've had enough therapy over the years, God knows. Mostly Freudian, although not all. Um, a lot of things you don't know where they come from, and you, you, I don't know what made me angry, I don't know what made me be able to fight back. Plenty of people have unhappy childhoods, and plenty of people have parents that they're not fond of, um, both of which are true in, in my case. But often, in those cases, the children are, are or the offspring are, are, are damaged in, 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 in sort of different and potent ways. Uh, I don't know what made me stand up to my father, who was very abusive to me, but I did. And uh, I had a mother who um, defended me, but, but whose defense I didn't believe. So I, I felt very much a, a loner and alone. I, I suspect that um, my brother, who shared similar feelings against, uh, toward my parents, our parents, um, was, 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 my, was my major role model. And certainly he has been exceedingly um, my parent in life. He, he backed, he's the one that sort of almost brought me up uh, and saw that I got the good education and, and did the right things, got me into therapy. <laughs> uh, so I, I don't know what this, if this contributes to the ability to respond to what I perceived as 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 a as a as a, a danger uh, when I did, but um, to this day I don't know really what what where all of that come from comes from. I had a mother who was a social worker. She ran the uh, the, the local chapter of, of the American Red Cross in, this, in a small Maryland town where, near where we lived. <coughs> and uh, so whether her, her notion of service and, and taking care of people and all that rubbed off on me, I don't know. I'd rather t tend to think not because we, we used to make fun of it. So, <laughs> you know, she was out there taking care of everybody but us. Um, but so be it. And if those were some of the early, um, early life experiences, what about things more proximal to when you first started to get engaged, when you first started to get active? What were some of the immediate things going on then that may have led you to? I mean, I just, I was, I had, I had a bunch of friends who got sick and I had a bunch of friends who died and, and I knew them all. And, and, uh, and a doctor whom, um, Alvin Friedman Keene of NYU, who made the first announcement in the NYU, in the New York Times of what was going on, a man whom I respected, said, um, I think it's read by Saxon, I think that something's going on here. And, and if I were, if I, if, if it were happening, he said, I think, you, I think people should, should realize that something is going on and, and, and modify their behavior accordingly. And I said that because it made a lot of sense to me. As I said it uh, earlier today, I don't think that it took any great perception. I'm always being given credit of being some kind of seer. Um, I don't understand why other people didn't see it too. Uh, as I said, anybody who's, who spent a night all night long in the meat rack at Fire Island Pines, um, should have enough brains to realize that something like this is certainly possibly happening. And God knows I've spent enough nights myself in the meat rack of Fire Island Pines. So, um, 
Looking back on it, I don't know. I was made angry by the fact that nobody was willing to pay any attention to it, and instead of turning my back, it just made me angry, and I'm glad that it did. Uh, um, we needed help, and no one was there to give it to me or to us. And I had gone to Yale, and I had been very successful in the world, and, and I was not used to being shunned. I had been assistant to the president of Columbia and then United Artists. I had supervised hundreds of employees. I had huge budgets that, that I oversaw. Um, I was used to people listening to me. And when, I, when we were trying to get our first office space from the city for a little minuscule operation, um, because no one would rent to us, even though we had the money, so we wanted something from the city, um, try to get a hold of the mayor, and I was pretty much told to, I was made to feel demeaned, and I didn't like the feeling, and that made me angry. At the same time, there was a, a, a letter to the editor published in the New York Native, our newspaper in New York, a newspaper, written by a, a playwright, now dead from AIDS, by the name of Robert Chesley, which um, made me very angry as well, because he was responding to my, my, my earlier plea, not the 1,112 and counting article, but I had written something earlier than that. And he, he, he just made fun of me and said that, there goes Larry Kramer again. He had hated Faggots, my novel, <coughs> and uh, in which he maintains Faggots is about that the wages of gay sex is death, which it certainly isn't, nor is it the theme of the novel. And what made me mad about Chesley's attack was that we had been together, we had been to bed together, and uh, he had come to interview me for a publication, and he professed to thinking that faggots was the greatest thing since sliced bread. And um, we went to bed together, which I, the minute I did it, I knew was a mistake. And, and he wanted to do it again, carry on with from there, and I, I didn't. And so he turned on me and wrote very nasty pieces about me in the gay press and then attacked me over my my call to arms, and I just thought that, that that made me very angry because that's not what it was about. You know, he was attacking me on a personal vendetta uh, level, and uh, the hypocrisy of that made me angry. And I was going to a very good shrink at the time, Norman Levy, his name was, and uh, and he saw how angry I was, and he says, "Well." Why don't you do something about it? And, and it went from there. I don't know how he said, why don't you just, I don't know, what are you? You're a writer, write about it. So then I sat down and wrote 1,112 and counting. I'd actually, I'd be interested to have you speak a little bit about what you think someone can achieve through their writing in terms of influencing others and mobilizing them for change versus what um, he or she can do through their actions. Because one well, of the interesting I know, things I don't know how to answer those questions. You have they're too they're too they're too global or they're too you have to have certain skills and you have to have the timing has to be right and and GMHC came along and people responded to it because the time was right and, and ACT UP came along and and uh, at a moment in time when there was all that energy ready to be coalesced and a lot of it is timing. Um, I don't think you could start an ACT UP today or a gay, a gay organization today that would get those kinds of responses as we got in those days. In terms of can writing change the world, well obviously I think so because, because, because that's why I'm a writer. I'm fortunate that I have certain skills or I've discovered that I had certain skills uh, to be able to, to, to write. Whether people are listen or not, I, I don't know. I'm always amazed when anybody knows who I am, and that's true. I just uh... I'd, li I'd like to push on this a little bit because it's one of the discussions within leadership: is uh, do great moments make great leaders, or do great leaders create great moments? And I guess if if you were thinking about things in the environment that would let something like an ACT UP or a GMHC um, take hold and take off, 
what, what sorts of things do you think that sort of um, are going on in the environment that makes it ripe for, for those kinds of I things? Just, my mind doesn't work that way. Uh, do great leaders make great causes or whatever? I don't know. Uh, what, makes, what makes a movie star? You know, what is it about a, a person's pers persona that makes somebody captured on, on film memorable and someone just walk across the screen and you've forgotten her or him? Uh, I don't think anybody can define those things. I certainly don't think I've got charisma or whatever. I think, um, I think now people respect me, but you know, they didn't throughout all of those years. I had a small group of people who were loyal and faithful and we managed to accomplish certain things and, and it's going on from sure. there. What, what, what skills or traits do you think that you brought to bear that that small group may have responded to? Or, or I've always said exactly what, I've, what I felt. Um, I don't care if, if it makes people angry, if that's how I feel. I've always been very honest and truthful and I've not been afraid to, to confront people of power. Um, and I've never been afraid of anyone. And I think as we were a community that was in New York that was frightened, um, that impressed people. Um, they needed that. Um, or some people needed it. There were plenty of gay people who, who hated me and who, who would cross the street not to, to be on the other, not to be on the same yeah. side. And that's true. I was no longer welcomed at Fire Island after faggots came, came out. I'm serious. I was actually asked to leave. Um, um, uh, and I'm sure there are people to this day who, who uh, from those generations who disapprove of me. But that, that, that has never bothered me, and I don't know where that came from. I've been able to ride. <coughs> um, and that, I think, just comes from a lot of therapy. Um, to be able to say what you want to say seems to be worth worth any price. Yeah. Um, I w it, it wasn't always that way. I was a frightened child, and I certainly was timid. <laughs> Interesting. Did you? Uh, are there any personal limitations that you think may have hampered? Limitations. Limitations. So if we, if we talked a little, or think a little bit about um, the ne the aptitudes that you had, things that you might say, gee, um, you know, without this, I would have been more effective, or oh. Well, I went through a period where I thought that all the leaders of, of who were fighting AIDS, everybody had a tragic flaw of one sort or another. The people who, who were the smartest, um, um, Matilde Krim, Joe Sonnabend, uh, myself, really had a sense of what it was all about, had certain character traits that rendered us impossible of being as effective as we could be. Perhaps my, my, my temper, my hot-headedness, uh, certainly Joe's inability to communicate with other people and, and Matilde's sort of, um, I don't know what her tragic flaw is, but um, because she's a great lady, but why couldn't she take it f further, whatever. Uh, she's, she had a, a, she was, she had a, she wasn't good at choosing people to run her organization. She had a bad sense of, 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 of management choices so that AMFAR never became quite the organization it, it should have been because she put inept people in charge of it constantly. <clears throat> so, um, but after a while you realize you, you and AMFAR are still there and Matilda's still fighting, so you realize that you work with what you've got, and, and I, I, I didn't know how to do it any other way. I mean, I just, you couldn't say, you couldn't say, Larry, shut up, because if Larry shut up, then Larry would be rendered immobile. Uh, I was very happy to discover, and I didn't know this, that, um, that I could write political rhetoric. Um, that was all news to me. I'd never tried before. I had been, I'd written faggots and I'd written, um, I had written a, a couple of plays that were 
very unsuccessful. And I had written, uh, I had written the screenplay for Women in Love, so I knew that I could write, but these were all different kinds. These were, this was more imaginative writing. Now I was writing nuts and bolts. Um, angry, angry rhetoric. I didn't know, I was just trying to make people sit up and pay attention. And I used strong language and I, turned out I could do it well. That was a nice surprise. I'm, I'm curious, do you have role models, either contemporary oh. or historical? And if so, you know, who would you identify and why? What is it about them that you either emulate or appreciate? Oh, I don't know. Um, when I was a kid, Helen Keller <laughs> used to make me cry. <laughs> uh, cry why? Because I tend to respond to people with, who, are, who can overcome physical disabilities in such a fashion as she did. Um, it still gives me the chills when I see people like that. Um, th are there writers that I admired? It's hard to say because I knew I was gay and I knew that there were very few people writing about gay stuff straight or gay, and um, so it was hard to say. I admire um, Evelyn Waugh, whom I do enormously, the, the British writer, um, even though he was a gay man who was no doubt homophobic. So did I admire him? He was just one of the greatest stylists in the world, and I learned from him. Was he a role model? No, he was not a nice person. There, I admired South you know, I admired a lot of the South American writers who, uh, like Marquez, who, who wrote political stuff. And I never, there wasn't an American role model that, that I had. There, be, being a, being, writing about political stuff and being a creative novelist in America just doesn't go together. And, and uh, I got a lot of flack from the, quote, gay literary mafia, unquote, guys, you know, um, who, who, because I, I wasn't saying what they wanted to hear, that gay is wonderful and blah, blah, blah. So, uh, so f for you, an, an inspiring role model would, um, clearly the tenacity of a Helen Keller, but in addition, it sounds like you were hungry for someone who combined the literary endeavor with the activism angle? I don't think I was hungry for it, no. It's the wrong word. I, I, if they were there, fine, I didn't see the person there. Um, but straight, straight writers or straight advocates, was there, in terms of someone from the world of advocacy who you emulated, or was it really a kind of see I don't, I didn't emulate anyone. I made it up as I went along. I said, I've said that quite often. We made it up as we went along in, in both GMHC and in ACT UP. What, what, was, what was needed that day? What was the emergency that day? Who were we after that day? Um, and it changed day by day. We made it up as we went along. You know, one day, the enemy was this person, and the next day it was that person, and you had to be able to, to be to be adept enough to, 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 swivel and punt and all of these things. We have a question we here. We did not have any role models, unfortunately. Well, one of the questions we typically ask, I think I'm going to modify. The question is, how did you stay alive in terms of maintaining your position in equilibrium, in the face of opposition? And if I might be so bold, it may sound that you came more alive. In the face well, of that's opposition. exactly why I stayed alive. I cannot tell you the excitement both of these organizations, GMHC and ACT UP, were in their earlier days. It was euphoric that you had, one had a group of like-minded individuals who were all fighting for the same thing and all getting along with each other and all just so excited about, about the fight and, and, and about being with each other. It was like big, uh, the, big the biggest fraternity ever. I don't mean fraternity because there were certainly women around. But in the case of GMHC and ACT UP, those first three or four years in both organizations, it was just, every day was exciting. Even though all these terrible things were happening, we were fighting and we were fighting together. And, and, and that's, what, that's what certainly kept me alive. It was, it was euphoric, it was exciting. It, we had meeting, and, by the time ACTA came along, we had so many committees. We had meetings every single night of the week and different people fighting for different aspects of, of, of the same problem. And, and we, they were all over town, people's apartments, various office buildings. 
and it, it was almost as if one didn't have enough time to sleep. It was so exciting. Yes, that's what kept me going, and and it was filled with a lot of a lot of love. We this is it was the best thing about being gay. It was the best feeling to be with all your brothers and sisters who were all working together. I've never seen lesbians and gay men work so well together as in, again, as in especially the early days of ACT UP. Um, if we had fights over things, we were able to work them out in, in the most amicable fashion. The women taught us a lot about, about women, about, about dealing with lesbians, which, most, which all of us had been completely ignorant about. And uh, it, was, it was heady stuff. It's, uh, during that time, was, th was there time for relaxing or time for play? Or was <laughs> well, we thought this was play. Uh, we had parties. God knows we had parties. I mean, you can't get a couple hundred gay men together without there being a lot of interactions of one sort or another. It got to the point where it was the thing to do, was to come to an ACT UP meeting. And, and, it was, and suddenly it was all the hot, hot young men we're going to act up, and, 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 and believe me, there were plenty, plenty of cruising, plenty of gay, plenty of, plenty of handsome men around, and, and, and I'm sure a lot of them were partnering in one way or another. And yes, there was a lot of partying, um, but that's, it was, it was it, we had a cause. It wasn't, it wasn't that we have to take time off. You know, we would vacation with each other sometimes or whatever, but People were dying like flies. That's the subtext of all of this. And I mean like flies. You know, when we started it, there were 41 cases was how many when it was in the New York, original New York Times article. And, and 1,112 is counting as that's how many there were. That was a few months later. And, and it was escalating. Where there's a line in the normal heart. Where we, where, we, we were where we were living was wartime, where everyone else is living it's peacetime, and we're all in the same, and we're all in the same country, meaning the straight people and the gay people, and and it, there wasn't a week goes by where somebody wasn't sick, where you weren't going to see someone in the hospital, where you weren't going to a memorial service, whatever. That's the subtext of all of it. So of course we clutched to each other and 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 found joy and affection and support where we could, and we we all got enormous sustenance from the anger. These these demonstrations that were were planned as you know street theater and all they, they were they were they were made with passion and with love with passion with love and with anger definitely with anger yeah they're not they're not mutually exclusive things you know could you we never we were never we never forgot that there was an enemy out there and that the enemy was them and very and very identifiable and there was a time I wrote where, where I, I didn't want to talk to a straight person in my own family. I, you know, my best friends, Calvin Trillin, I once said to him and, and his wife, dear friends, you know, I don't want you, I can't have you as my friends because you're not helping me fight. Uh, and I certainly said that to, to my own family. So uh, I, that's, that's what it was like. We were at war and nobody understood that. And yes, you, most people thought I was overreacting. I didn't think so. No one in ACT UP thought so. Would you uh, paint for us a picture of, you, of how you view human nature? <laughs> so what do you think are some of the most striking things? Of, uh, I don't, I, 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 people don't behave very well in groups. I've said that. Um, I don't think very much of human nature. I'm not, I'm a very positive person who's got a lot of negative thoughts about the world. I think basically people are shits, uh, greedy, selfish, and um, single-minded about the wrong things. Uh, yes, we all have friends that we love very much, but there's precious little mil milk of human kindness around or, or charitable do unto others kind of thing. Um, I think there's an awful lot of pretense and a lot of hypocrisy. Um, that doesn't mean that I'm not happy or that I don't have a lot of friends whom I love, but I think basically if you take human nature as a group, who was it, Samuel Johnson or somebody who said, um, who was it? In essence saying, I like Peter and Paul, but I don't like the humankind. 
right. kind of thing. And that, that's basically how I feel. We are simply beastly with each other. This is a plague that was allowed to happen from day one. What I was saying then, 1,112 and counting is now 60 million and counting. And all these, whatever years it is since 1981, uh, it just gets worse and worse and worse and worse. And we have said exactly the same thing every single year. We've pointed out exactly what was happening and, and nobody in any effective authority or, or position of leadership has done anything about it. Let's, let's talk a little bit about that. So you, I could imagine when you talk about the them, it could be the individuals in leadership. But I could also imagine it would be kind of a sort of great unwash, an unmobilized middle, similar to your friends who you said, you know, at this point you're not with me, so I have to, you know, stick. So I'm, I'm curious how you think about that challenge of, of the few who are clearly um, the leadership of the opposition versus um, how we think about the, the, the great majority of folks who are neither with you or nor against you. What do I think of them? I think they're pigs. Um, it's hard not to. And do you, did you see your role as engaging or, or speaking to them, or were you really focused on the leadership? You can't make people do what they don't want to do. Um, for a brief moment in my life, there were enough people who cared about the same issues that I did and were willing to come and fight, so we had an army. That army has disappeared. Um, I have a great deal of impatience with many of my friends, many of whom are quite wealthy, who do not do anything, including write checks. And um, so be it. You can't make them write the check. All right. Uh, the, so if the first set of questions thought or asked a, quite a bit about individual experiences, I'm going to switch now and ask you a couple of questions about thinking about the folks who um, you help to mobilize, mm -hmm. so people who are part of the... How do you see, um, if someone wishes to mobilize or engage other individuals on behalf of particular goals, um, are, are there ways to do that? Is that you think it's more of a natural kind of organic process? Are there... I mean, you can imagine someone having this, this vision or this anger and isolation versus um, pulling together others who are, you know, to create this army of like-minded individuals? There's an essay I wrote in Reports from the Holocaust about how to mobilize a group, how to, how to, um, I wrote it in the, somewhere in the, along the way, mid-80s, about if you wanted to get together and start a group. I don't think that it's all that different now, if you care. Um, In my, in my estimation, to be a, a successful activist, if you will, is to identify an issue that you care passionately about, that really turns your juices on, and that can sustain your, your anger. You have to understand that I consider anger an incredibly positive emotion. Um, Unequivocally so, or? Oh, you, you, you go too much for the, for the yes. extreme, um, unequivocally so. No, I mean, it's love, do I approve of love unequivocally? I mean. Yeah, but you, you've yet to see anger, too much anger in a situation. Yeah. Well, let, let me put it this way. I'm surprised that there hasn't been more, um, more out and out violence. The people have put up with such shit, uh, especially people of color, especially poor people. Um, I'm amazed that there are not more riots of one sort or another. Um, the downtrodden masses are certainly downtrodden. Um, and any thoughts? We, I asked earlier about human nature. Any thoughts on why that anger is so, so easy to, if not to ignite, if it's so hard to ignite, or why it's so easy to expunge, or why we don't see that anger more? I think people are afraid. I think that. They're afraid of police, and, and in most countries, they have very good reason to feel to fear them, including ours. Um, people are essentially cowards. People are essentially don't have the courage of their convictions, and and, not, and quite often don't know what their convictions really are. Uh, 
people just want to be left alone. They want to go home to whatever's there and be safe. Um, you can have the you can have the the uh, most awful things happening in your family or in your life, but there's a safety and silence and and being alone. Uh, it's unfortunate, perhaps, but it's understandable. And, and I'm curious though. Did you see your role at all as to shake people from that? That's uh, you know that false sense of security. I didn't see did my you? role as anything, and um, people always said, "Oh, you know, you had you had strategy and you made this. You know, you planned all this out." We didn't. I've said it before. I said it again. We made it up day by day. I didn't see my role as anything except to be as useful as I could, uh, wherever I could, in any way I could, um, to whatever it was that I thought needed attention to that day. I found that I was effective in. I was a good name caller, uh, and I wasn't afraid to do it. And there wasn't anybody else out there who was willing to say that the mayor of New York City was gay, for instance, or that, uh, or that Ronald Reagan wasn't saying the word AIDS because he had a gay son. All of those things were said in public by me, which was considering, you know, shocking tactics. Um, so what was the question? You've answered me. <laughs> um, I, I've had the benefit of, of hearing you speak earlier today, and I guess what I would ask is one of the things you mentioned earlier was, um, you know, pulling together a group of people with energy and passion, mm -hmm. um, but at the same time trying to maintain some kind of focus, you know, so that the group doesn't begin to address all the issues or all the range of concerns it might have and really focuses on a singular. I Could didn't you share pull, with us? I, I didn't pull them together. They, mm -hmm. People responded because they knew it was there and they were frightened. And I was a focal point for that and the time was right for that all to happen. Um, keeping people focused was not easy in it and, and, and I didn't have as much control over these organizations as, because they were too unwieldy as people might, might think. But one is able to say we have different, we have a different agenda that we should have to attend to first. And the people responded to that. We were desperate for something to take, some kind of medicine to take. And if you could just keep people focused on that, and it wasn't that difficult um, because everybody needed it. So that you could say, let's deal with that and not whether, you know, there, people are being discriminated against in the hospitals, which was, a, which was something for GMHC to fight. Who are your allies and who are your opponents? Today? Um, let's answer it both. Let's go, let's look back and then let's ask for today. <laughs> your allies, whoever, who's ever there with you, fighting with you, and, and who are your opponents? Everybody else. Okay. That's a lot of people, That's a lot of opponents. That's what it sounds like. Yeah. Well, you have to realize that people don't like gay people and they are they're never going to like gay people and and you can either let you can either face up to that and and stand up to it and, and confront it or you can lie down and be a victim as most gay people do um, we are not loved we will never be loved there will always be a church that hates us a religion that hates us and and uh, a family person and good friend that is uncomfortable with it so better best to face up to that and deal with it than to go in the closet or, or be ashamed of it or punish yourself for it. Um, How would you define a good citizen? I don't, I'm not interested in being a good citizen. Citizen is a word that's too loaded with, with, with them, with the bureaucracy, whatever, being like everybody else. I define a good human being as somebody who has who takes responsibility for his life and making the world a better place. How, it's, again, what's interesting is a, a lot of your work challenges the questions that I'm asking. Yes. So I'll read the original. You're them. <laughs> <laughs> I'll read the original question and, and then I'd be curious how you'd modify it. So <clears throat> the question is we typically ask is what in your view constitutes constructive opposition? 
And I guess I would propose it, it sounds based on you know, uh, hearing from you that there may be no such thing as unconstructive opposition. So you might even challenge the premise of the question, but I'd be curious See, to I hear get, you. I've already, I'm already lost in the rhetoric of your question. I don't, I've, I've lost, it has lost meaning to me. I don't understand what you're saying. Um, you're trying very hard, which is fine, to, to parse me. And, and parse you how? Like I'm a sentence with a subject and a predicate and a verb, and mm -hmm. and uh, and you know people aren't so aren't so diagrammable. What I am today is not what I'm necessarily going to be tomorrow, and that's certainly true in the case of of one of my best friends now in the world is Dr. Anthony Fauci, who's the head of 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 and the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease. We truly love each other now. It is the most wonderful friendship. In 1983 or four, I wrote a series of articles that appeared all across the country in which I identified, I call him a murderer. And that was how I was then, and this is how we are now. And he'll be the first one to, 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 to talk about those days. That, I mean, that's a remarkable journey for two people to go through. So yes, can, well, can you reflect on, on? I think we're both I think we're both proud of of ourselves that we both we both helped each other and learned from each other and and uh, and that we have this friendship now. Yes, it is a remarkable journey. It's exceedingly moving because of that. This life of these last whatever since 1981 has is been filled with things that are exceedingly moving that bring tears to your eyes. You mentioned earlier that um, the group was, um, as you can imagine, um, expressing itself in different ways, and that it w there was no central kind of thing. You also use the metaphor of an army, which is interesting, because typically we think of as an army as very regimented, very organized, and very orderly. So I I'd be curious to hear you reflect on, on the kind of the tension of trying I to I got a lot a of flack in ACT UP for using the word army. We are an army. They hated it. Uh, not because it was regimented, because it connoted uh, violence of a certain, or, or control of a certain way. And this is a group of people who certainly did not want to, in any way, think that they were being controlled. Um, and, I, and one didn't have control of them. One only could use one's ability of, of whatever, persuasion, respect, whatever. Um, there was a moment in time when there were some 30 or 40 chapters of ACT UP in the United States, where I, I realized that if I wanted to, I could make it into an army. And I thought a lot about it and decided against it. Uh, and I don't know that I could tell you why. That's exactly what I'd most hope to know, the deliberations. Yeah. So, so what well, would be the benefits of, of armatizing it, and what would be the drawbacks? Well, I'm sure there's some of, of both. I just instinctively thought it was not the thing to do. And you ask why a lot, and I used to ask why a lot. And after a while, you realize that there aren't any real answers to why, or there are a million answers to why, and one's just as good as another. Why are gay people so passive when their lives are at stake? Why, 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 why didn't everybody fight for their lives when they knew their lives were in danger and still are? Uh, I don't know. Why did I do certain things? I don't know. I just, a lot of it was instinct, hunch. You know, why am I a writer? How am I a writer? Why do I write? well or badly. I don't know how to answer those. Uh, what, what, makes, what makes a creative person? I don't know. The description I gave to you early on of my childhood is quite often the description that is offered for, uh, for many writers in their lives. Is that what made me a writer? Uh, you know, perhaps. After a while, the wives don't make so much uh, difference as, as the hows. And as and as the what are we going to do about it? What? Yeah. Mm. Was there a question ever in your mind about? Um, I'm going to use the word secession, 
But if you think about the momentum that these groups you're a part of had at different points, did you ever look to the future and say, what's gonna, who or what will continue this momentum? Or was it really about riding the crest of a wave without really looking what became before or after? We had plans. There was a man called Pop, Paul Popham, who, uh, who was the president of the board of the original Gay Men's Health Crisis. He and I, it was, our, it was the two of us, our energy that really got jamming, kept it going got it off the ground and uh, we used to think that, that we had the makings of a great movement for gay health um, that when this had all passed which of course it didn't but we thought it would that we would somehow metamorphose all of that into you know a Kaiser Permanente or something like that <laughs> That's terrific. Um, uh, and then after a while you realize that You can, you can think of all these things, but there's never a way that you can put it into practice. My lover, uh, David Webster, is always saying, why are, you, why are you the only one still doing this? You know, what, wh where, are the, where are the other people to, to come out there and scream and yell and, and do what I did? And they don't seem to be there. So yes, it would have been nice. I didn't. I'd be happy to turn it over to somebody else and fade into the sunset, but I don't see anybody there doing it. There were more people well, originally than there yeah. are now. And then now I'm curious, because I could think about someone to hand it off in two ways. Why aren't there more people who are contemporaries with you at that time, who have gone on and you know, left these issues behind them? Or alternatively, why aren't, isn't there a next generation of folks who seem as energized or engaged? Again, there you go with your whys again. I don't know. Okay, I so then, uh, well, no, no, well, so then I'll surrender the whys and ask the how. So, so how if... <laughs> How, if, 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 you know, if I were to set my sights on um, not having as many folks kind of, you know, fade into the background? Well, you, most of my contemporaries died, so that took care of a lot of them, certainly the people who, le who were leaders. It's amazing that a number of the people, a lot of the people who showed up to, to take leadership and, and, and positions of responsibility in the early years somehow sensed that they were sick. They weren't, we didn't have tests, whatever. Maybe they were just worried that they were, and in most instances they were right. So, um, if that was part of the fear that motivated them to come, I don't know. People left law firms, people left big jobs making a lot of money to come and work for GMHC, to come and devote themselves to ACT UP. Because I think a lot of them sensed they were the next ones, and in most cases they were. So, in terms of the younger generation, I just, I, th I think very, ill of it or them. I really, I really truly do. We fought all these fights, fights for them, and it's as, it's as if everybody died in vain, and I consider it a shocking, a shocking abdication of responsibility on the part of almost every gay man and lesbian that I know. Those are strong words, and I have a lot of gay and lesbian friends, and I think most of them would agree with me. And why it's that way, I don't know. I don't know. Things are okay. You got drugs. You can get married and adopt a kid. All these, all of these are wonderful achievements, but they are also pacifiers. Um, pacifiers from what? So what's the agenda? What's the agenda? It, the, what's the, it what's pacifies the, your anger. You know, for most for most people, life is, I guess, okay. I guess I don't know. I mean, my life is fine. Uh, Could we turn a spotlight for a minute, um, and this group may or may not have existed, but I'm curious about them, which would be the folks who um, joined in these efforts who didn't have that immediate kind of um, self, it, self-interest may be too strong a word, but you know, it, may, it may have been straight people who chose to work with you, it may have been women who weren't um, directly you know, at risk of, of contracting. Um, I'm, I'm curious what, if anything, you think compelled those individuals to to be a part of this? I think a lot of people were generally moved by, by, by what was happening. Were they helpful to you? I guess mm -hmm. I would ask, were, were they helpful to you? People who joined ACT UP like that, you mean? Or people yeah, who people who may have joined ACT UP who weren't necessarily, didn't they, have that visceral kind of threat from the issues. Well, I think that there was certainly compassion on their part, and that's certainly visceral. Um, as I told you, we had a wonderful woman 
called Iris Long, who came in, a, bio, a biochemist, I think, of, who came along and taught us all our first lessons about, about the system and, and the science of it all. And, and she was just a, a, a married woman from, straight married woman from Queens who was, who was upset that the world was allowing all this to happen, and she was a straight woman. There are plenty of, of, of mothers who came along who either had lost children or had friends or were just moved by the, by the, by the situation. You have to have a pretty hard heart uh, not to be moved by it, and some people were moved enough to join and help. You can ask the whys, and you can come up with good answers, but that doesn't necessarily bring more people into doing it. If I, if I knew the secret of what makes people come and fight, I'd, 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 I'd be a rich man, spiritually and every other way. You know, it's interesting. It's, it's a, the metaphor would be a military that's not by conscription, but by, you know. Uh, I think, I don't know what I think. This, people are, this country is so awful. And the government is so awful. Awful how? It just is. It's just hideous to people who are poor, and who are people of color, or who have nots. 50 million people don't have health insurance. Uh, those kinds of statistics. The millions of people in poverty, uh, in the richest country in the world. And uh, that's what I mean by, by awful. A president who lies constantly and gets away with it, is not held to, to uh, to task for it, who has nothing but support from, from, from a certain segment of the country which happens to hate pe people like me, who is able to raise millions and millions of dollars to be reelected where we can't even get a candidate to, to be recognizable enough to want to support. Um, these are all very unhealthy, unhappy signs. Uh, It's 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 not it's a it's a it's a country that is not a democracy. It's a it's a country that 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 is hypocritical and hateful in very very many ways. It's fine if you got money, and very few people do. And what? It's 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 strange because again I don't want to go to the place of the why, but to stick with the how. <laughs> how would you encourage, uh, if, if you had the year of folks who are in those disadvantaged positions? Well, I said to the woman from South Africa who said, what can we do? And I said, get off your ass and fight. You know, stop looking to other people to help you. Uh, it's nice if America could bail out everybody, but we can't. And, and uh, there are 60 million people infected across South, across the third world. Um, that's a lot of people to make a lot of noise, and you hear very little of it. Why the, why the president of South Africa, Mbeki, hasn't been assassinated by now, I simply do not know. The man is an idiot and, and just evil. Right. Evil. And so much evil is allowed to exist. Let, let, let me push on this for a moment, sure. because one of the things that strikes me about that comparison is that the kinds of tactics you would use in the U.S. where, and I'll put this forth as a hypothesis, you can tell me if you agree or not, where it's really a, a distribution question where the resources are there, and you just have to have them distributed or focus the attention on the disease, versus in Africa where the infrastructure isn't there, where the government spending isn't there. So arguably, um, you're shining a spotlight you know, on things when they have basic nutrition problems, basic education problems. So I guess I am curious how we think about those two challenges and whether it, in both cases it still comes back to people, you know, coming, um, finding their voice and, and starting to misbehave or to behave <laughs> as they should. Again, again, I get lost in the rhetoric of your question. So it comes back to the... Uh. You want to take, take the question back to where it should be. How much do you want to stay alive? How much is that worth to you? That always seemed to me to be 
the most important thing is that I desperately want to stay alive. And you have to fight to stay alive. People are not going to keep you alive. Um, they can help you, but in the end, you're the one that's got to fight for them to help you. When you I'm curious, when you say stay alive, are you talking specifically physically stay alive, or yeah. is there an emotional life? Is, I guess I'm curious how far you would extend that to. As far as you want. Whatever, whatever, whatever you need to, to have, it, however far you need to extend it. I mean, I mean it just like that. I mean, staying alive, not dying. Uh, no, I don't think of it in spiritual terms or philosophical terms, I mean it in practical terms. I want to live. And, 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 and in 1981, uh, I want to live and presented with a problem that might kill me. And first of all, you have to identify what it is that, is, that you think is going to be this thing that's going to kill you, and how do you stop it from killing you. It's very, it's very pragmatic, everything that that we did and that I attempted to keep us focused on. Mm. We wanted to live, so what does that require? It means identifying who's, 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 who, who doesn't want, who the people who don't want us to live and the people who can help us live and how do you get the drug companies to, to do what they're supposed to do and how do you get the government to do what they're supposed to do. These are enormous problems and it took a lot of self-education on the part of us in ACT UP. Any, any, I'm, I'm fascinated by this notion of, of discipline and staying focused and I guess I'm curious, any times when your attention where it was hard to focus because you felt that, you know, this other sort of activity or this other thing was just so compelling or so, <laughs> or was it really, I mean, if, it was if, a if it's a life. It, no, yeah. it was okay. strictly pragmatic. Uh, I learned early on that, that I only had so many hours in the, the day, day and I only had so much energy and there were a lot of things that I cared about and that I could fight about but you had to be you had to be very brutal in in in, in choosing in choosing your fights and and some of the fights were more important than other fights and we had a lot of fights over which were the most important fights god knows you know women's health rights when you're an organization uh, of men and women how do you you know we're fighting for women's health rights too I'm sorry, women's health, women, women's health rights across the board, no. Women's health rights with HIV, yes, uh, or with AIDS or whatever. So that's what I mean about, 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 about being harsh. Yes, it would be wonderful if we had national health insurance uh, or better insurance, although we did deal, although we did make insurance, we did gain a lot of, uh, of changes in the insurance law in New York State. <coughs> um, but that's what I mean about being brutally how do you get the government to research things that they don't want to research? How? how? I mean, people would look at you and their mouth would go like that. And, and when you think about it, your mouth does fall. How do you even begin to attack something like that? Who do you go after? Who is the person? Which is the agency? Where's the money from? Who's the congressperson? I mean, there's an enormous cast of characters involved in every question you ask. And, and these, ca and these yeah. people change every minute because they're leaving town or they're getting reelected or not reelected. Did, did that maze ever prove demoralizing? Or no, was it? It, was, it, was, it, was, uh, it was almost like a game after all. You call somebody up and they're not there at the office and, oh, what happened to her? What happened to him? Ah, oh, well, tell me about yourself. And then you have <laughs> to start giving AIDS 101 to everybody. Every reporter who got, who got assigned the AIDS beat knew nothing about AIDS when they started and you really literally had to give them a AIDS 101 every time. It still happens. You're realizing within three seconds of talking to a reporter how much he or she doesn't know. So you have to tell them all and then you have to, you know, the media, that's another thing that is very important that I didn't talk about. The media can be your friend and, and, and I made it my friend. I made it, I made it my job to know all the, the reporters I possibly could, whether they were writing about us or not. Who and Larry, I'm about to ask the how question. <laughs> well, so, so I like to, to make the media friend, uh, to make the media your friend, how? No, I don't mean media. No, no, I, I know, but I'm curious. So, so keep, keep with that, that line well, about how, how to work the media in that way. Well, there's a woman you should call Sarah Just, who's the producer of, of, of Nightline on ABC. And um, it took forever for a couple or any of those or that program to do anything about about AIDS and I just kept calling her all the time and she was and she kept taking the call even though I kept yelling at her and sending her very strong emails and she'll talk about it she's Larry taught me everything I know about AIDS 
she's important, so you, it's worth the effort to do all of that. And then they did do some very good programs. And when they do a bad pro program, you tell them it's a bad program. And they begin to be nervous about your opinion, and, which is good, which is the, what you want. So that's the kind of work and you have to do. How are you envisioning using the, the press? So was it general consciousness raising? Was it shame? Was it what, we what was need, We had no bridge to the outside world. We had a president, Reagan, who did not say the word AIDS for the first se in public for the first seven years of his, of his reign. Now that's unthinkable. Seven years. And then when he did say it, it was very unnice what he said. And we were there to boo him, which he didn't like uh, at all. Um, we had, that w and so how do you get a message out except through the media? And how do you, f you know, you have, you have cl closeted gay reporters who don't want to come near you. Um, you have people who are homophobic who don't want to come near you. But slowly you begin to recognize the people who will listen, especially if there's a good story involved. And there were plenty of good stories, you know, about heart warming self interest I mean it's human interest stories and uh, and 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 little by little you you know and you can never stop because there'll be a, there'll be a whole raft of stories for t for three months and then they don't want to write about you again so you got to whip it all up again it's, that's what I mean that activism is never ending you, you, you can never stop but it is possible to identify a few friends perhaps perhaps not so many in the bureaucracy, but, but among the people who, who, um, who, could, who could write about the bureaucracy. Mind you, they, you know, there were people in power, certain senators and people in Congress who, who were on our side, um, Waxman, for instance. Larry, let me ask, yeah. yeah. Does it, I, I'm, it's, I'm, I'm struck that for a while you were an activist, really in a hotbed of activity, where you had a lot of activists <laughs> you know, in arms with you. And today, um, as you mentioned, it's a battle to get the articles, it's a battle to get the coverage, and a lot of folks have fallen away. So I guess I'd be curious, any, any reflections on being an activist when you've got, you know, a whole community around you similarly engaged and, and trying to be an activist when you're really... You, know, you mean, is it lonely now? <laughs> if, if lonely is the experience, then lonely. Um, well, um, or maybe you enjoy. You, you know, I, I don't know. I, I guess don't I'm curious. Think th I don't think that. Uh, I'm 68 years old, and I've just had a liver transplant, and you don't have the 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 sustained energy that I used to have. Um, I don't miss going to ACT UP meetings, even if they were there. I don't miss having the same fights. Um, the things that I cared most passionately about have been, a lot of them have been achieved. There are, there are, I don't know, 18 drugs out there now that will keep people with HIV alive. That was, that was my original goal, find medicine that would keep us alive. Uh, there isn't a cure, but there's something that can give you, that in, in many people will give them a, a normal life. Um, so the pressure isn't so much on, and, 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 and the battle in other areas is being, I pass on to others. Um, as I say, I'm, I'm disappointed that other people haven't come along with any great visibility to, to let do me what ask I you, did. Sure. L let me ask you about one person who has come along who, um, my students actually went back and forth quite a bit about, but I'm interested in um, Zaki Ahmad in a South African context. And in particular, I'd like you to speak to, he took a personal pledge um, not to take yeah. his drugs because well, he could afford them. We had a Bobby Thompson or whatever his name was, a nurse, a man in San yeah. Francisco in the, in the early 80s did the same thing. So I guess what I'm curious about is, again, not part of a larger strategy, not part, just, again, thinking about human nature, thinking about the role one can play as an activist. W what do you think of, of that kind of... I, I think I... Or what's your reaction, is shy of analyzing it? Is that something Larry Kramer would do? Is that something... No. Why? I would not, I would not, not take medicine. Because I want to stay alive, and he's more used to alive than dead. And to endanger his health that way is to endanger his, his usefulness. Um, 
there are equally dramatic things that can be done, like, uh, you know, throwing himself on Mabeki, on Mabeki, Mabeki, or whatever. You know, there are physical things that he could have done that can be done by activists that are not so dramatically endangering to his own health. Um, uh, people think that I got a lot of my medicines or that I got my liver because of who I, who I am, um, which certainly was not the case. Um, but believe me, if I had to use who I was to get what I needed to stay alive, I would have done it. I think it's important to have a sense of self-preservation and all of this and not, and not victimization. Um, his, 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 his symbolic act didn't achieve anything. Um, there's not to say that it wasn't a, a brave and valiant act, and I wish that more people in Africa were, were dram as dramatically angry in one way or another. To, to contribute to pushing the button. All right, the, um, these are going to ask you a little bit about the context. Um, and again, we're interested in some of the things that may be going on in the environment when certain advocates um, come to the forefront. What is it about the situation in which you found yourself that you most wanted to change? <laughs> and this, I, I'm imagining, will be an easy one for you. Everything. <laughs> and it's pretty much still the same way. I do not like being discriminated against in it. And I, I guess I want to have just as much as they have, they being the heterosexual majority. And I don't like not having it. And I don't like not having it because they don't like me. What, um, what were the major, major contextual constraints? So what was going on in the environment? What is contextual? That's such an academic word. What does contextual mean? Things that were happening. So if you imagine, um, or if you were trying to get what the other group has, right? What was going on at the time that you began to, or if, you, or if your goal when was- at the time? Since time began, people have hated gay people, and it's still the same way. So nothing could be more contextual than that. Well, let, me, let me push back on you, because uh, from what I understand, your goal was not to get people to like gay people, but your goal was to get access to certain institutions Well, it all amounts resources. to the same thing. Uh, I'm not getting these services because they don't like me. This is, it's cogito ergo sum, or whatever the expression is, ergo. Um, you can, okay, sure. Make, make some of the linkages, because right now I could imagine we could have um, certain HIV drugs developed without a uh, heterosexual majority being particularly um, well-intentioned towards gays. And so I, I guess well, I'm curious. Well, but, but, I mean, that's certainly the case. It's happened right. because it's turned out that, that pharmaceutical companies make a lot of money off, off of the medicine. So right. doesn't, that, that takes care of itself. But, but, but no one thought there was any money in it originally, right. believe it or not. So is, is your advocacy focused, um, or you can, you can push back and say that there are two they're too intertwined to disenta disentangle, but is your advocacy focused on gaining access to certain resources and institutions, or is it focused on sort of liking and saying, why doesn't this other group like us, and how I are we going to eliminate those attitudes? I don't care if they like us. I don't care if they like us, and I think we spend too much time worrying, both as, as a population, as an as this individual, that people like us. It's a waste of time. They're going to like you if they want to like you, and they're not going to like you if they don't like you. You have to find the things that you need, that you're not being provided with, and, and get them. You're entitled to them. Everybody in this country is entitled to good health, good, good health care. 50 million people don't have any health insurance. Why are they so passive? Why aren't they setting fire to the buses? I told you that story, my favorite story. Actually, would you share that again? Because it's oh. a great story. Well, we had a, ACT UP had a demonstration outside of City Hall somewhere in the early, in the mid-'80s. No, ladies. We had about 300 people, and it was a fairly peaceful demonstration. And there was a, a woman, who, a woman reporter from Brazil, who came over to me and said, you call this a demonstration? She said, in my country, when they raise the bus fare, 
they burn the buses. Well, why aren't we burning the buses? Why are people so passive when they don't? Why were women so quiet about breast cancer for so many years and still continuing, you know? Breast cancer has been around forever. And it's only the last few years that they've come up with something. Where's the pressure from this entire female community in the world? Arguably the majority, the world majority. Yeah, figure that one out. I don't know why. Because it doesn't happen, because by the time you get it, it's too late to be an activist. But so what? I mean, you know what's down the pike. Well, it's interesting. One of the arguments for why you don't see a more effective advocacy for children is that in people are parents only for a relatively short while, and then the children grow up. So it's not as strong as these other groups that people belong to mm -hmm. for their entire life. All right, this last set of questions is, is a challenging one for us because <laughs> they, they really move you in the direction that you're... Uh, they're moving against stream. They really are trying to to understand an, an environmental cause instead of looking to individuals. Mm -hmm. And they're asking the why not, you know, they, they're asking them well, what's happening outside individuals. And, and one theme that I'm taking away from our conversation is the, um, the value or import of looking at the potential within any person to stop or interrupt that, you know, and, oh, and to begin. I just think everybody's got such power inside of, a, of him or self to move mountains. and, and it's not so difficult to, to reach if you have the desire to reach it. A lot of wasted energy and manpower in, in the world. A lot of wasted brain power. It's very sad. It's tragic. All right. um, we've made it to the end of the official interview guide. Um, <laughs> what I'd like to do guide. is... Guide. This, this, these are the right. questions you ask everybody. Huh? Well, the, the value out of asking is we'd like to see some trends or, or see how people grapple with them differently. What, while, are, what are the trends you see? Um, I can't speak to that now. <laughs> um, you haven't interviewed enough people? No. There's, um, I'm also swayed by the interview that I'm doing now. Um, <laughs> let, let me, Good. I'd like to give you the final word, and I just want to throw out two things that kind of jumped out from the conversation and the earlier conversation you had at the center. Um, one is this notion of anger um, and its importance and its role and its healthiness and, and a any number of things that I think you sort of really bring to the forefront. The other is um, something around personal experience, personal affronts, personal relationships, and an experience of advocacy that really seems born not in an abstract, why is the world this way, but really as a first person kind of, I'm experiencing this. Mm -hmm. and so I'd be curious for any final reflections you have um, that you might want to share with, with future students, current students, but in general, perhaps these two themes are themes that are important to you. It's, it's a loaded last question. <laughs> it's, it's too cosmic for me. Uh, again, I, from the beginning to the end, I lost, I lost the focus of what you were asking me. Um, so the general focus is simply any final reflections you have or things. And I was just sharing two things that sort of emerged for me. One is the personal experience and how that really played a role. Well, I think, yes, it did, but I don't think... I think everybody has personal experiences that are painful, um, that they either abide or push aside or ignore or deny. Every mother's got a kid in school who's had some kind of experience of a bad education. Um, that should be enough to make any parent angry enough to protest and doesn't. Uh, Every woman has, has a dozen friends who've had breast cancer. Um, we all have these personal experiences. Um, it's just a question of recognizing them and wanting to do something about it. And, and why the world, why everything is allowed to stay the way it is, is because people deny these problems and are overcome by them and are not unwilling to confront them or are overwhelmed with how you attack them. And, um, and indeed, it does take a lot of work to, as I hope I've made clear, to, to identify 
what you can do about them. Um, but one should look upon that as, as a challenge, like reading a good mystery story and trying to figure out who done it, um, rather than something that becomes so crippling and allowing the status quo to remain that way. Uh, I'm, I'm amazed at how passive people are, even, or especially smart people. Um, it doesn't take but one person to hold a, hold a placard up in public when, when, a, when, a, when somebody is presenting publicly the point of view of the government, say, and you, and you want to you wanna show your anger. One person holding one placard can get a picture in the paper, can embarrass a public official if it gets in the paper, and they're terrified of being embarrassed. That's one thing I learned. And I've been that one person a lot of times, and yeah, you sort of get a little stage fright when you're up there <laughs> doing it. And, and yes, you know people who think you're an asshole, but, but when the speaker starts fumbling and getting embarrassed, and you know, you know that you, you scored, and it reverberates down the line somehow. And if enough people do it, uh, it certainly reverberates down the line. And ACT UP was successful because enough people did it. Enough of us held up those placards. Um, just placards being one of many things that you can do. Uh, if enough people write letters to enough Congress people, they hear it. I'm not such a big fan of the letter writing thing because all that tends to get lost in the, in the, in the shuffle. I'm, I'm much more keen on, on visibility stuff. Um, and it's not such a terrible thing to be arrested, which I have been many times, which we all were many times. They can't do anything to you. Um, you know, we're so terrified, oh my God, I'm arrested. Uh, you know, they, they take you and they put you in a cell and you hang out for a while <laughs> and they let you go. So you've lost a half a day. But when enough people get arrested, they don't like that because it ties up the system and whatever, whatever. You want to embarrass them, you know. The, th the, the, the demonstrations and things that changed, changed history, all those anti-Vietnam protests, changed history. Uh, I'm amazed that there are not so many of them. I'm amazed that so many people put up with so much shit without doing anything about it. Larry, I think you give us a wonderful paradox, which is <laughs> the question of why not more, and then you also give us a vivid example of when and how someone did. So thank you. Uh, okay. It's been absolutely a pleasure to talk with you. Good luck. <laughs> I don't think I've ever done anything special. I don't think I've done any, I always, People come up to me and say, thank you for what you're doing. And my first reaction always is, why? huh? My, re my, re my reaction is, why aren't you doing it too? It's no big deal. And, uh, Which I love. I mean, and you did that today. I think that kind of holding up a mirror for other people and saying, yeah. don't emulate me. Just ask, look inside yeah. and then see. But why, I mean, is it, I mean, that, that comes back to the question of human nature. Is this? Yeah. <laughs> Do you want me to shut it off? No, no. keep it going. <laughs> um, but that's too easy to say it's human nature. That's a, that's a cop out. There are 80 zillion people in the world. Everybody's got a different human nature. So different so people. Right. So what is it? So why is it? Or let's let's stay with the how because mm -hmm. I know the why is is, is uh, so the how how is it that you get large numbers of people to move beyond the complacency of everyday life, the perceived comfort or the perceived security, in order not to act on behalf of anyone else's interests other than their own? I mean, leave apart whether we could get groups acting for others' interests, but simply their own self-interest. Well, uh, how? You speak up and say what's on your heart every day to everybody you can, which is what I do. 
when you see something awful going on, you try and identify it to your friends publicly. Isn't this awful? Um, and don't be silent. Silence equals death, which is the famous ACT UP motto. Um, and that's true. You find ways, you find ways to make noise. It's not so, it's simply not so difficult. I was amazed at that professor t today who was, just, who was complaining about he can't get Harvard to, to give the, a, a, gay, a gay student center here. And, uh, and I said, have you, have you got tenure, was the first question I asked him. And he said, yes. I said, then what do you care? Well, they can't do anything to you. Go, go pick at the president's house. And such a thought never ever occurred to him. What, what's such a big deal about standing outside of whatever his name is house and saying uh, Abraham Lincoln was gay or we want to be able to study that or we want gay studies here or whatever, you know? Especially especially effective because it's not coming from a kid, it's coming from a, a middle-aged man who's on the faculty, even better. And, that, and that, that never occurred to him. That's, that's the conformist army in which everybody marches, everywhere. And I guess I learned how to glory in that difference somewhere along the line. I couldn't march in that army for various reasons. I was gay pr primarily. And, uh, uh, so you learn how to glory with your difference, and 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 just that glory. In it. I love being a homosexual yes. man. I was picking up on the word you're using, uh, glory, because yeah. it's, it's a rich one. I love being gay. I don't want to. I wouldn't want to be straight for all the tea in China, um, and it hasn't always been that way. But and it's been a long journey from there to here. But it's been a wonderful journey. And all of these experiences that I've talked about with you today, dramatic as they were, it was, it's been an incredible journey. I've, I feel fortunate to have been able to have lived the life I've lived and to have been able to be useful to the world. Uh, that gives me a lot of pleasure that I've been well used um, for whatever reason. And, uh, and that journey is available to anybody. That was no big deal. Uh, a little more stubborn, perhaps, than, <laughs> than others. But God knows everybody's got that in whatever. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay. Get me to the airport on time. <laughs>